Hi, I'm Ronald, the Rules Lawyer, and I'm going to talk today about how to buff casters in your game if your table wants to. Now why this video? It'll surprise many of you that I'm making a video about buffing casters after I've made a number of videos defending the balanced decisions around casters versus marshals in Pathfinder 2e. Also, I'm the Rules Lawyer. Every table should do what's the most fun for them, and that is the most important rule. Now many people, including me, enjoy the balance between marshals and casters in Pathfinder, and see something rewarding in a roles-based system, it creates a real incentive to work together and you literally share heroic moments. But many people coming to Pathfinder for the first time expect X from a caster when it's actually more like Y. Especially for people coming from other editions of D&D and Pathfinder, there are raised expectations where casters are kind of expected to be able to either do everything plus what the marshals can do, or can have dramatic spikes in power when using their limited spell slots. But in Pathfinder, the power of casters already exists from the sheer versatility, the hugeness of their spell lists. Playing a caster well involves using the many tools in your toolbox and using each tool when it suits a situation. This means there's a higher skill floor to play a caster well than other classes. So I think this video is important to ease the process by which people learn how to play casters in the system. I, for one, want the community around Pathfinder to grow, and there's a danger that people coming in will have a bad experience that makes them give up on casters or give up on Pathfinder entirely. And so some tables may want to consider buffing casters, at least during a learning period. Also, some people don't want a class that has such a high skill floor. They're willing to give up the versatility and utility of casters in order to have a narrower focus, such as doing damage while being more competent in that narrow focus. I'll share a quote from a Redditor, D. Merciless, over at the Pathfinder subreddit, where they say that the game is so focused on making sure a 900 IQ player with 20 years of TTRPG experience doesn't explode the game on a caster, a noble goal, and that, for the most part, they achieved, that it forgets to consider what the caster experience for the average player is like. There's a little hyperbole to make a point. However, it is true that the designers plan for a minority of players who are able to destabilize intra-party balance and encounter balance if they were given the opportunity. I'll share a link to this post in the description. Given that many, if not most, players don't play at that skill level, maybe we should consider some buffs, at least during the learning process, for some tables, some individual players, so that's why I'm making this video to explore the possibility of homebrew to buff casters or improve the experience of caster players in the game. Also, even if you don't think casters need buffing at your table, you may find some suggestions in this video that will improve your game. There's another post on Reddit, and I'll share a link in the description, that answers the tendency of many to discourage any house ruling and tinkering of Pathfinder whatsoever. I tend to agree with the sentiment that people should try the default game first before tinkering with it. However, I think this post does have a point that if you do decide to tinker with Pathfinder, the game is so solid and balanced that it's easy to adjust it, turn dials on it to get the desired experience that you want. And one reply to the post said, A lot of people treat Pathfinder's balance like a restriction, like the system will instantly combust the second you take a single step outside the strict boundaries. But it's exactly the opposite of the case. So in my recent video, I talked about how at some tables, you might want to lower the difficulty of encounters with some groups because they have suboptimal party compositions, or the players are still learning, or because that's the level of difficulty that table finds fun. I think the same can be said about the martial caster balance as well. I think Pathfinder made the right decision to give us a solid foundation, but that doesn't mean that every table must use the foundation as written, nor is that even possible to enforce. I will give a warning though. I might disappoint. I'm a bit of a curmudgeon, and a lot of the suggestions in this video I will preface by saying, well, try to do something else first. So the first thing I'll say is don't homebrew yet. <laughs> first, watch my videos. Specifically this video, which also has the title, Why Casters Must Feel Weaker in Pathfinder 2e. There I talk about why the balance decisions in Pathfinder exist, and also talk about the real strengths casters have in the system. The fact that their power is in their versatility, whereas marshals are tough and do consistent single target damage, casters fill the other functions needed in a party. 
that damage is not just raw numbers. As casters, you can do more damage types. You can target weaknesses, target different defenses, any other convenience of ranged attacks and the relative safety of doing ranged attacks. And then my next video was on how to cast your good in Pathfinder, giving practical advice on optimizing and enjoying being a spellcaster, including build tips, in-play advice, and specific spell suggestions. So basically I'm saying give the game a chance as written as intended because you may find that you enjoy the play style that casters offer. My first piece of advice for adjusting your game, I wouldn't call it homebrew actually. It's simply to lower the difficulty of encounters. This is something obviously that is not specific to casters. It affects everyone in the party. As I say in that other video, I think that the default difficulty in Pathfinder is not enjoyable for some players. We don't want to discourage people from continuing to play Pathfinder. And also, there could be a vicious cycle where in the face of adversity, players, and not just casters, but also marshals too, can fall into rotations, patterns, sometimes from previous RPG experience. Things like using your entire turn to make weapon attacks or spell attacks. Giving more breathing room to players who are learning the system will allow for more experimentation and trying things that haven't been tried before. You want to try to not just do direct damage, but try to set up for another player. You want to look for synergies. And of course, lowering the difficulty doesn't have to be a permanent change. This is something the GM happily can adjust at any time in Pathfinder. So the tips are pretty straightforward. One is to build easier encounters. Instead of a severe encounter at the end of a dungeon, maybe a moderate encounter. Another suggestion is to give more hit points at level one. Level one is particularly swingy. A critical hit from, I think, a level two monster and above can knock down a fighter. And critical hits happen often in Pathfinder. These knockouts can lead to a vicious cycle and lead to a death, and if the party doesn't retreat, a TPK. What this suggestion is, is simply to give another level's worth of hit points. So you have your ancestry hit points, let's say you're a human with eight, and if you're a fighter, you add 10 to that. And this homebrew would be to add another 10 to that, so that it's 28 hit points before adjustments. Then when you become level 2 and level 3, you reduce the increase in hit points by 50%, so that by the time you're level 3, you are where you're supposed to be under the system. This makes level 1 much more survivable and for many tables more pleasant and less deadly. Another possible adjustment is to apply the weak template to all creatures. This is especially useful if you're doing a pre-made adventure. Memorize the weak template in your head, and it's relatively easy to implement. Another suggestion is to adjust or avoid higher level monsters. This becomes less true as the party gains several levels, but at level 1, a level 3 monster with their advantage in statistics and the fact that level 1 parties have less tools to swing the battle in their favor, and they have fewer hit points, means that those fights feel more severe than the encounter balancing system would suggest. A level 3 monster for a 4 person level 1 party is only a moderate encounter in the map, but I would say in play it feels more like severe at least. So give them the weak template, or avoid level plus 2 creatures entirely, or use them with caution. Same thing can be said about party level plus one creatures, depending on the group. This can feel particularly frustrating to casters who are using their limited spell slots to try to attack a foe. An inexperienced caster might, for example, cast Grim Tendrils against a level three ogre warrior, which happens to be its best saving throw. The ogre critically succeeds and is completely unaffected, and that can feel pretty terrible. We now move on to ideas that specifically target casters with the aim of improving their experience. Not everyone who complains about their caster experience has the same complaint. It's important to figure out what their specific complaint is when considering what to do. One complaint is pretty specific to low-level caster play, which the vast majority of people who are playing for the first time will be at. And that's the complaint of lack of endurance in the adventuring day. When you are level one, a wizard will have maybe three spell slots for the entire day, and each spell can be attempted only one time. This can lead to a bad experience if the GM is running a lot of encounters in a single day, and the adventure paths in the first couple of years of Pathfinder 2e's existence put a lot of encounters, sometimes in the very first day of the adventuring party's existence. 
So to address this, first, uh, in general, I think GMs should be very generous with respecking, including in the middle of the session to ease that new player's experience. And one respec possibility is to allow them to somehow have a focus spell if they don't already have one. Focus spells tend to be more impactful than cantrips, comparable to your first rank spells. And as you level up, they also heighten. But if that caster has the opportunity to refocus for 10 minutes between every fight, and if in an adventuring day they have five fights, that's essentially five more spell slots that that caster has. Also, obviously, it should be a focus spell that that player will enjoy. Another suggestion is to increase the number of spell slots for level one characters. This is very analogous to the homebrew of increasing hit points I had earlier. Basically, give the character the number of spell slots that they would have at level three at level one. So, for example, I'll show the wizard's advancement chart. Instead of having two first rank slots, they would have five. This not only would give them more encounters where they feel they are having an impact, it also just feels less bad if a spell misses or doesn't meet expectations. You have four more spells that day. At level two, they would have the same number of slots. Then at level three, you would go by what's written. Another suggestion is to buff those cantrips that are the fallback when your spell slots run out. I'll share a link in the video description on some homebrew cantrips that clearly indicate which current cantrips they replace and give a little something extra to each cantrip. Another complaint about casters is the difficulty and strategy required in selecting your spells. Prepared spellcasters have to predict which spells they'll need for that day and how many castings of each spell. Players may find they don't have the right spell for the day, or if they have a fixed spell repertoire, they're a spontaneous caster like a sorcerer, they're saddled with a spell that they don't like, period. Some players also want to avoid the stress involved with the strategizing of being a caster because they don't want to mess up. Completely understandable. These suggestions address the higher skill floor issue that some players may not want to engage in or want to have some easing into as they're learning the system. My first advice, obviously, is to allow a free respec if that is the case. Allow them to change spells that they prepared that day or selected for their spontaneous caster. Add a focus spell or change the focus spell that they chose. Similarly, prepared spell casters may want to consider being spontaneous casters. Get a set of solid spells. My How to Cast Your Good video has some suggestions. So that way there's just more freedom in spell casting. They don't have to worry that this is their only casting a magic missile, for example. And if their Grim Tendril spell is completely resisted, they can try again. Also, more tables should be aware that flexible preparation exists as an official class archetype. This is available for prepared spellcasters. This is spellcasting similar to how it's done in 5e, where you prepare a library for the day and every spell can be cast using spell slots in any of your spell ranks. This greater flexibility is balanced by the fact that you have fewer spell slots. But at level one, when people are learning, the only difference is, is that you have three cantrips instead of five. Meanwhile, the two spell slots you have, each of them can be used for either of your prepared first rank spells. And unlike the sorcerer, you can change them from day to day. Some players might prefer this type of spell casting. Next suggestion is to buff the recall knowledge action. One of the ways casters are balanced is that they have the opportunity, much more than marshals do, of being able to target any of the four defenses that monsters have. Not just armor class, but also their three saving throws. Recall knowledge as written is a bit vague in how a GM should run it. And it's also possible for a GM to read it in a way that it does not give some vital information for the combat. As written, for example, you will learn that a red dragon breeds fire. <laughs> I did a whole video on how to fix recall knowledge in our games. So I suggest buffing it by allowing players to ask specific questions, including what is the weakest saving throw of this creature? And also when they don't ask to freely give that information when you scan the stat block and see what's useful for the caster to know or the party to know. Also, I allow repeat attempts in a combat because you can ascertain things as you observe a creature as they're fighting. And also, I'm more generous with determining what DC you use. Things like that. It's all in my video. 
but generally to encourage the recall knowledge action at your table. Another suggestion I've seen is an Achilles heel mechanic. Basically, if a caster targets the weakest save of a creature, lower that saving throw of the creature by two. This would buff casters and also further encourage the use of recall knowledge. Another homebrew is to give casters the level 10 magic item Shadow Signet for free. This specifically helps spells that use an attack roll, which unlike spells that call for a saving throw, have zero effect if they don't hit the target's AC. Basically, casters have the option to aim at their fortitude save or their reflex save. The number to target is that saving throw plus 10. It's metamagic, so it can't be combined with other metamagic, but it's a free action. This also encourages recalling knowledge and playing smart. Another one that's seen a lot of popularity online is to provide potency runes for spell attacks. Martial characters are able to make their weapons more accurate by slapping runes onto them. A plus one rune is a level two item, plus two is a level 10 item, plus three is a level 16 item. I personally don't have much experience with this variant, but the conservative version of it is to apply that bonus only to spell attacks and not to spell DCs. It basically is another way to give more motive to use those attack roll spells. Another approach that might possibly be more sound is what Paizo itself published for the Kineticist, the Gate Attenuator. And their proficiency progresses at the same time casters do. There's a level 3 item that gives a plus 1 item bonus to your spell attack rolls, but not your spell DC. And a level 11 item that gives a plus 2 bonus, while not giving a plus 3 item. A stronger buff would be to apply these bonuses to their DCs as well. One would want to be careful, again I don't have personal experience with this variant, but it would affect big AoE effects also. Also these mathematical buffs are to address the fact that casters are behind marshals in their main attacks mathematically through most of the span from level 2 towards the high levels. I would just remind people who use the suggestion that casters can become legendary at level 19, whereas most marshals cannot. One suggestion that's been put out there is to have casters advance in proficiency in spellcasting at the same time as the marshals. So most marshals, for example, become expert at level 5 and master at level 13, whereas casters become expert at level 7 and master at level 15. I hesitate about this suggestion because there is a real increase in power at level 5 because of the power of third rank spells. Pathfinder does have D&D's tradition of having a significant power boost at that level for those spells. I also hesitate about the boost at level 13 because by that point I think most casters are happy with their character. They can cast Chain Lightning, Eclipse Burst, Mass Haste, Mass Slow, uh, so maybe that boost isn't needed. That's just my opinion. If people have experience to answer my concerns, uh, definitely love to hear about it in the comments. Another complaint from caster players might be that they just simply want to blast better and are okay with not having the versatility and utility that a full spell list gives them. They want a more straightforward class to play. So my usual advice of allowing someone to respec first before making changes continues. First, I would allow free respecs if they've already started playing, and suggest the Kineticist, which fulfills the fantasy of the Blaster Caster while not accessing the full spell list. It is more complex to build than other classes, but in play, it's like having a handful of spells that are at will, and it's simpler than being a spellcaster. Also, there's the Psychic, which has the full spell list, yes, but they're able to spend two focus points every combat to amp their cantrips and make them quite powerful. This is at the cost of having fewer spell slots. It's a bit of a more complex class, and also there's the mechanic of unleashing your psyche, which enhances your damage more, but some players want that, so there's the psychic. Then there's the Magus, who can deliver their spells, including cantrips, while at the same time delivering weapon damage. And that gives some very satisfying burst damage. And there's a subclass that allows you to deliver those spells through your arrow. 
I also want to give special mention to the Elemental Bloodline Sorcerer. The Sorcerer itself has more spell slots than any other class, and it's a spontaneous caster, making it beginner friendly. And also, the Elemental Bloodline is pretty good at delivering consistent damage. When you cast your Bloodline spell or use a spell slot from this particular list, it adds extra damage. Their Bloodline spell is Elemental Toss, which lets you do 1d8 bludgeoning or fire damage, if your element is fire, and it's a single action. And you have the primal spell list, which has a lot of excellent damage spells. So Electric Arc is available to you. You can have a turn where you attack three creatures all at full accuracy. Now we go to homebrew ideas that I'm sharing for the community, but not personally recommending. One idea I've seen in comments to my recent videos has been, what if we were to make a homebrew class archetype that limits spellcasters to only no spells that do damage while boosting the power of those spells. So give up the versatility of their spell lists, but boost the damage. I hesitate about that idea because I think that Pathfinder, for good reason, avoided having party's ability to do lots of damage be tied to a limited daily resource, namely spellcaster slots. It means that the power of the party to dish out damage at any particular time depends on whether it's the first fight of the day or the eighth fight of the day. It makes the encounter balancing system less reliable, and it incentivizes resting more frequently. And also, it may be hard to categorize what exactly is an only damaging spell. Ray of Frost not only does damage, but can also slow a creature's speed. Briny Bolt does damage, but also can blind a creature. And even Heal can deal damage to the undead. Also, as I pointed out in my How to Cast Your Good video, the tools to do this apparently are already in the system. You can use existing options, and if you laser focus on damage, you can exceed what ranged marshals can do for a few fights in the day. And we're talking here about single target damage, which marshals and most parties tend to dominate. For the rest of the fights that day, their damage is less, but comparable to the ranged marshals. I go more into it in the How to Cast Your Good video. Another homebrew idea I've seen thrown around has been to address the fact that casters are not able to play as much with the three action economy as marshals do, because a lot of spells cost two actions. So I saw the question raised, well, why don't we have more one action spells to complement the two action spells? First, I think there's a lot of single actions that casters can do that are quite useful. So I'm not sure this is very necessary for casters to be having more varied turns. You can set up your own attacks with the Bon Moss skill feat, demoralize, recalling knowledge. You can also do a weapon attack. You can also stride to approach an enemy or to leave an enemy or to provide flanking to an ally. You can raise a shield. You can cast a shield cantrip. You can cast guidance to help an ally. You can aid an ally. You can use battle medicine to heal an ally. There's The list goes on. So I'm not sure what one action spells could exist that aren't already served elsewhere in the system and which also, if they were added, would add to more complexity to caster players when I think the general desire is to have playing a caster be simpler. Now, what about a one action spell attack? Well, we're getting into kineticist blast territory. And already it's been shown that if you focus on blasting, you can match and sometimes exceed what range marshals can do. I think the future for having fun with the action economy, however, is to see more variable action spells. We already have some with the heal spell and horizon thundersphere. And Cone of Cold, now being renamed to Howling Blizzard, now having both a two-action and three-action version. I don't know, I'm kind of happy with that. I've also seen the question raised, well, casters are expected to support marshals. Let's have more ways for marshals to support casters. Well, my colleague Swing Ripper would say there are ways that marshals can support the rest of the party by debuffing enemies with grappling and tripping. This makes them flat-footed or off-guard to everybody's attacks. They can also recall knowledge. The wish seems to be to have marshals have a way to lower fortitude and reflex saves. However, I think that is a bit misguided because lowering those saves also strengthen marshals who want to grapple and trip enemies also. 
I think there was a reason why the Advanced Player's Guide, the second book, came out with only a skill feat to lower will saves, bon mot, and that that was targeted to help casters a bit. But instead of having new defined rules in that regard, I think a GM should encourage and players should try the aid action. Anything that the players can think up that makes sense in the fiction and that the GM approves can be a way to help the caster. For the record, I think aid as written is too hard at low levels. It's a fixed DC of 20. And I actually plan a video on how I would house rule and improve aid. So I think that runs the gamut of ways to buff casters in Pathfinder 2e. As with any experiment, something new, you want to reassess at some point whether you're achieving your goals and whether what you've changed is still needed. If you're simply helping new caster players ease into the system, talk to them and find out what they think. You want to assess, do casters feel like they are contributing equally at your table, whether they're being too buffed by the changes, or whether they still feel weak. Also note that buffs to casters will generally mean that their spell slots are more impactful and therefore might encourage the party to rest more frequently to get those spell slots back. You'll want to keep an eye out for that, and if it is happening, see if that's something you want to be happening in your game. Also, a good time to check to see if you still need the changes is at level 5, when casters get to those third rank spells, which are a jump in power, and also level 7, when casters become experts in their spell casting. They also have more spell slots by this point, can last longer in the adventuring day, and have more spells and better spells. Spell casters do feel stronger as you level up in Pathfinder. So that's it. I think I'm done in my caster's saga for now. I hope this video was helpful. If you enjoyed it, you might want to join my Discord where people talk about Pathfinder 2e, including, as you can see, build advice and design and homebrew. And we also have a drop-in play system where people can take the same character from adventure to adventure and level up and gain treasure. Also, if you haven't yet, support my Patreon, which allows me to continue making videos, where you get seven day early access to many of my videos and also exclusive access to videos, including my chat with veteran Pathfinder players, brainstorming advice for players of casters. So that's it. I hope this video was helpful. Let me know what you think of these suggestions. Do you have more suggestions that I didn't think of? If so, leave a comment. So that's it. I've been Ronald the Rules Lawyer, and I'll see you next time.